the bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlet Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. And here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Tim Stenovic and Jess Menton. Welcome to our audiences across Bloomberg Television Radio Originals and those folks streaming us on uh, YouTube. Uh, a spike higher uh, into the close here uh, for the major indices right now. Yeah, finally seeing some buying uh, on the uh, S&P 500 and the other major industries just after a week last week where we saw the worst week for the S&P since March. And basically snapping a three-week winning streak for the S&P 500 last week. But if you look today, especially more growth-oriented corners of the market, communication services leading the way up about 2% higher. So interesting to see how this momentum could potentially continue the rest of the week as we obviously have that CPI report later in the week. Meantime, you have bond yields moving higher, uh, resuming uh, the sell-off that we saw in Treasuries last week. There was a little bit of a reprieve on Friday, but the big question is, what will the CPI and PPI data that come out later this week do for yields? Yeah, that's what I'm curious about. We So we get, was that, Thursday, right? We get CPI or Wednesday or Thursday? Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday. But it gets to this broader idea, though, that if you do think that we're trending in the right direction. Even if you get one report that maybe doesn't is an outlier here, is that going to really change uh, the thesis in the way that you value this market, guys? I mean, it depends on who you talk to. We just spoke to Dave Donabedian over at CIBC Private Wealth Management, and he's pretty concerned with the data that we've seen, Romaine. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. He says that um, it's all the problem is is that all that stuff is you know that, those aren't leading indicators. Yeah, absolutely. he's really troubled by the yield curve, and you know. Well, you go ahead with the bells, but he's got some more thoughts. <laughs> yeah, give, give us some thought, uh, Tim. And as you uh, collect your thoughts there, uh, we'll go through the closing bell here. A relatively uh, broad-based uh, rally here on the day. Uh, a little more than 80% of the stocks in the S&P 500 moving higher, contributing to a 40% gain on the S&P. That's good for about nine-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq composite up about six tenths of a percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, that's your outperformer here on the day, up by about 1.2 percent or more than 400 points. And the Russell 2000, which had been the laggard and still is the laggard and spent the entire day uh, in the red, now poking back into the green as we get uh, to these closing bells, up about a tenth of a percent. Okay, I've gathered my thoughts. I'm, I'm okay. going to finish them. Um, Dave Donabedian <laughs> saying that he's, he's really contrarian right now, so I wanted to highlight what he had to say because he's kind of, I feel like it's getting lonely and it's actually going to be, there's actually going to be a recession corner. He he said we haven't actually even seen to feel, started to feel the effects of higher interest rates. We've only kind of like felt a quarter of the effects of higher interest rates. So there could be more pain to come. Well, there's been some pain in Apple earnings. So if you look at the yeah. industry groups and how they performed on the day, it's really interesting. It's a broad-based advance, right? You've got 21 out of 24 industry groups in the green, led by media, entertainment, and consumer services, which is basically um, online travel sites, cruise line operators, casinos, and hotels. But look at the industry groups that are in the red. Tech, hardware, and equipment, that is Apple dragging things down. Autos, that is Tesla dragging things down. Two of the biggest weighted stocks in the S&P and the NASDAQ 100 are accounting for, uh, I don't want to say weakness in the market, but keeping the indexes from rallying as much as they could. Taking a look at the gainers today at the close, have to point out Berkshire Hathaway, specifically the Class B shares, rising 3.6% to close at a record. This did come on the heels. Obviously, we had their earnings over the weekend that did exceed the conglomerate's previous high, obviously, in March 2020 for Class B shares, but those earnings coming in better than expected. And then we were just talking about Sovos Brands, that's ticker symbol SOVO, so Rayo's parent the pasta sauce maker. So Campbell's Soup did agree to buy the pasta sauce maker in a deal valued at $2.7 billion. So you are seeing that stock up about 25%. So it's biggest day on record. And then my last one I wanted to point out is Viatris. So this is a pharmaceutical company. It's actually one of the best performers in the S&P 500 today. So this did come on the back of them beating a second quarter earnings estimates. And it did say its divesture plans are on track. All right, Jess, you got the gainers. I got the decliners. Scarlett, you hit a couple of these, uh, but they're worth repeating because they're the big ones. Apple shares falling once again down 1.7% today. Fifth day in a row that shares fell. Longest stretch of declines since December, all in the wake of those results that we got on Thursday. Tyson Foods finishing it down by 3.8%. Shares dropping the most in one day since May. This because the company said it was shutting down four additional chicken facilities uh, after fiscal third quarter sales trailed even the lowest analyst estimates. These are in Arkansas, Indiana, and Missouri. 
Surrey. The CFO did say the production will be moved to other facilities for efficiency purposes, uh, but still, uh, the stock getting punished today down 3.8%. Tesla shares also finishing the day down by close to 1%. Uh, we learned that there was a shakeup in the C-suite after Tesla CFO Zachary Kirkhorn stepping down after 13 years at the company. All right, uh, we do want to talk about yields, but let's uh, actually get to some earnings uh, crossing the wire, Paramount. Uh, now uh, crossing the wire here, their global 2Q revenue Coming in right on the nose here, $7.62 billion. The street was looking for about $7.43 billion. So a modest beat here uh, on the headline number here. Need to dig a little bit deeper into the release, guys, to get some more details here uh, on profitability and, more importantly, on their overall strategy going forward. But the main headline here uh, is a modest beat uh, on revenue in the most recent quarter. Definitely want to hear more about what their streaming strategy is. But uh, one thing we do know is that Paramount is also uh, divesting some of its assets, including the book publisher, Simon & Schuster. KKR is going to be buying the book publisher uh, for $1.62 billion. So that headline coming out in addition to the results. A package deal, yeah, I guess. Absolutely. All right, let's go. Let's go back uh, to the yield space real quickly here before we get back to earnings, because of course this was a day where we did see a lot of activity. Uh, basically, yields uh, up across the board here uh, on this Monday afternoon, but you can see they're much more lopsided to the longer end of the curve with the 20 and 30 year yield up about six to seven basis points. Of course, this is going to be a busy week uh, for Treasury issuance. The Treasury Department kicking off what's going to be the biggest refunding slate that we've had in about a year. 42 billion of three year notes that hits on Tuesday. 38 billion of 10 year notes that hits Wednesday and 23 billion of 30 year uh, bonds on Thursday and of course that all comes against the backdrop of two big economic reports the CPI report on Thursday and PPI guys on Friday. Yeah it's uh, not just uh, the economic data that we're going to get we're going to hear from Fed officials who I guess are, are not going on vacation this week <laughs> like everybody else we're going to hear from Patrick Harker tomorrow uh, we heard from a couple of Fed officials today Jess and then of course uh, Raphael Bostic uh, is going to give uh, some comments on Thursday but the general uh, theme at least uh, thus far this week from the two we heard from today is, you know, expect higher rates for longer. And we do have Jackson Hole coming up for a couple more weeks from now, but starts on obviously the 24th later this month. And the day before that is actually when NVIDIA will be reporting its results. So the last of the Magnificent Seven. So even though it feels like we've gotten through the majority of earnings season with more than 80 percent of the market cap and the S&P 500 having reported, we still have Disney on Wednesday as well as the retailers with Walmart next week. I just want to jump in here because we also have Palantir reporting. Palantir, of course, the uh, data analysis software firm that's very much tied up with AI, works with governments and companies with sensitive networks, uh, falling in the after hours trade by more than 10 percent at the moment. Uh, let's take a look at the second quarter numbers. Revenue of $533 million, slightly better than what was anticipated. Adjusted EBITDA in the second quarter, $143.4 million, also higher than the consensus estimate. But let's take a look at the outlook. Uh, third quarter revenue, 553 to 557 million dollars analysts were looking for 553.9 million full year revenue it sees it above 2.21 billion dollars analysts uh, excuse me the company had seen anywhere from 2.19 billion to 2.24 billion dollars so um, not quite going to what it had previously anticipated in terms of guidance for the full year revenue perhaps that's part of the explanation for why the stock is falling in after hours trade yeah, I just want to get over uh, to some other company news. This involving HPE, HP Enterprise, learning that the CFO there, Tariq Robiati, uh, scheduled to actually depart the company uh, later this month. Apparently, according uh, to uh, Bloomberg reporting, he's going to take a job at Ring Central hmm. as the chief executive officer. So I guess a bit of an upgrade, at least in terms of title, for uh, Tariq Robiati over at HPE with the CFO there uh, leaving to take the CEO role over at Ring Central. This caught my eye. I actually had a chance to sit down with them. Uh, last uh, summer uh, at their headquarters uh, down in Houston here, a very vital component to some of the growth that we had seen at HP in recent years. Yeah, uh, seems like a big day for personnel moves. You have, you know, big news out of Goldman Sachs. You, of course, have big news out of Tesla. Now mm -hmm. this news out of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, I do want to talk Lucid real quick. Uh, we're getting numbers from uh, the automaker, the EV maker. Shares down in the after hours. Uh, the company's second quarter revenue missed estimates, uh, though the company did say they are on track just to manufacture over 10,000 uh, vehicles so 
far this year. Tiny when you think about it compared to the major automakers and, of course, Tesla as well. And I have to point out what's happening with Beyond Meat. So that company just reporting results after the bell as well. Looking at that stock down about 12 percent in after hours trading. The big thing coming into this, investors wanted to know about the cost cutting efforts to really fuel the margin expansion. If you're looking at it right now, second quarter net revenue did I, miss those estimates. So really pressuring that stock after hours. Remain. I just don't get this. I mean, we're talking about a growth trajectory that seems to have been going in the wrong direction for quite some time. This was a company that, of course, came out of the gate, at least when it went public. We were talking about triple digit growth. Right. Rates. It slipped into double digits. And now we're talking about negative growth here. 16 yeah. percent in the first so, quarter down, 31 percent in the second quarter down. Uh, and for a full year, we're still looking at down about 7 percent. This this was the, this is the big question, Roman. I mean, we talked about this two, three years ago. The talk was this is the future, right? Yeah. I mean, the pandemic growth that we saw. Well, uh, Dina Shanker over at the Bloomberg News team has done some incredible reporting about this. I guess the question that I have, though, is is, it, is this a Beyond Meat challenge or is this a sector challenge? I think it's a Beyond Meat challenge because we've talked a lot. You said it's the future. It is the future. There's no doubt about that. You see that in the broader trends. The question is whether it's Beyond Meat uh, is going to be the beneficiary of that. All right. Well, we'll have some... Uh Beyond, or uh, I don't want to call it fake meat. I feel like that's too pejorative. Protein technology. That's the, yeah. the peas. For it. That's peas. It's peas, that's, peas that's sausage. What, that's what we'll have. What yeah. Well, maybe we'll put it in some Rayos and it'll taste yeah. uh, Eric Balchuna said good. that we you. looked like the uh, Brady Bunch whenever he was with us. I'm sorry. Like every Italian American out there. <laughs> All right. I got to go. Apparently, it's too hard to get into the restaurant. That's why I haven't been. That's what I'm told. All right. That is going to do it for I mean, cross platform but coverage. Oh, but Roma, it's too hard yeah. unless you're Romaine. Yeah. You'll, okay. Maybe you can add me to the guest list next time. Yeah. I well, I know somebody. All right. Well, join us tomorrow <laughs> for you know Bloomberg, on Bloomberg TV, radio, and That's YouTube. Reminder, you can also check out Bloomberg Business Week also now on Bloomberg Originals. We'll see you guys tomorrow.